Colonialism. It's a hot topic in academics and in the cultural conversation in America, and it's become a conversation regarding board games as well. This week on Board Game Faith, we discuss an AV club where we look at a YouTube video that explores an important topic. This week, we look at colonialism in board games as part of our AV club specials. Welcome to Board Game Faith, a bi-weekly podcast on the intersection of religion, spirituality, and board games. My name is Kevin Taylor. And my name is Daniel Hilty. And we are so glad you are here. Well, welcome again to all of our listeners on our podcast and the viewers on YouTube. Uh, we're so grateful to uh, have you joining us today. Kevin, it is great to get to see you again. I'm jealous of your studio decor, Kevin. You've got some cool stuff around you. I, so for those of you who aren't seeing the video, which is totally fine, what I see behind Kevin, this is just an indication of how cool Kevin is. There is a Superman cape draped over your, your bookshelf. There is, a, well, it appears to be a lava lamp. And I, I think I know that you can control the color of that lava lamp. And then on the wall, you are featuring the cover of uh, punk, punk, Steam Frost, the Steam Frost game, right? The new Steam Frost game. It's Frost Haven, the Frost Punk sequel. Ah, uh, nice, nice. It, I might totally messed Frost up punk. that name. It is Frost Steampunk punk themed. It's called Steampunk in an icy age. Right. So it's it is Steam Frost Punk. It is set Frost in punk. in the late eighteen hundreds, the nineteenth century in England. Okay, and there was a global ice age. And mm. one area to survive because they had a massive coal tower to heat an area is London. I think okay. it's London or, or, or it's named after London. And this is called New London. Okay. Okay. And this is okay. a community that has survived a global ice age of the 1800s. So they're definitely steam, steam ice punk is what it really is. Okay. 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 Yeah. I know I'm so hip. Like I didn't buy games for a while. I don't think and then i got frost haven and frost punk so I, I i just i'm so cool i don't know what to do i you are so cool i just i feel considerably cooler just hanging around you for these few minutes so and the and frost I, is also making it cooler it is it is just i feel i need to go out and temperature and, differences yeah yeah i gotta get some frost games going right. yeah it's gonna be a long summer <laughs> <laughs> well uh for um Wherever you may be listening from, our listeners or, or viewers, we hope that you are in, enjoying a, uh, a a room decked out with all sorts of cool things as as well. Um, and today we are we're we're having a lot of fun here to get started. We're talking about, uh, however, a, a really a, a, a more serious topic, but an important topic, and and one that I'm so grateful, Kevin, for you s suggesting. Um, as you mentioned in our intro, this is the second edition in our Board Game Faith AV Club, where we are finding videos online that deal with some sort of board game related theme. And then we're discussing that video here in an episode of Board Game Faith and kind of exploring kind of the spiritual re religious implications of that. A and this week for AV Club number two, uh, we are considering a, a video called Playing Colonialism, a Board Game Ethics that Kevin, you found on the, the Homo Ludens channel on, on, uh, on YouTube. Um, which is a channel that explores the intersection of board games and history. And, right, uh, right. Yeah, Homo and, Ludens is referenced. Well, hum, we are Homo sapiens, right? Which right, is right. thinking things, thinking creatures. It sounds right. From Latin. Yeah. Greek, Assyrian. It, it might be. I um, think, it's, I think Kling, it's Latin. Klingon. Yeah. Klingon. Keep going. So yeah. it's a play. Ludens is Latin, I think, for play. So right. beings that play, that's what Homo Ludens refers to. And, and it's a phrase that's been around since a book in the... the Earlier this century or last century? That's, or yeah. 1800s? Hues, Huizinga, right? Like a Dutch philosopher. I think his name was Huizinga. Yes. Uh, it was a book called me. Homo Ludens. It called Homo Ludens. Yeah, this idea yes. of we are playing beings. Yeah. We're playing beings. So... If you're not familiar with the phrase, I wasn't at first, that's, that's the reference. So it's a bit of a, a nod to the theory behind 
play in board games. And then yeah. AV Club, what does that stand for, Daniel? Um, stands for Daniel. I I I believe it uh, stands for um, um, archaic violins. No, it's it's audio audio vi- we. Next week, Stradivarius. No, <laughs> Stradivarius. Um, it, it, audio video, out of tune. right? Right. Does a Stradivarius out of tune sound better than a non-Stradivarius in tune? I think it it well may, but it's a good topic for AV Club number three: archaic violins. Um, but no, we're we're uh, <laughs> AV for those who aren't familiar with it is audio video, and and I think that's yeah, a reference or to audio visual. Yes, audio visual visual. See, I never. I, this is another sign of how much cooler you are, Kevin. There but used yeah, to audio be like closets. Visual. It was like the AV closet at a school or something. Right. And it's where right. all the audio visual material or, or things were kept, like VHS cassettes or TVs and VCRs or DVD players on, on carts. That's right. That's right. So, yeah. and, or, or as I recall, taking Spanish in like sixth grade, we had a, a camera with a film strip to show videos about spain or mexico yes. or something and that that would have come out of the av closet that was locked up because you didn't someone stealing it and there was an av club which was an organization of students yes. and they would often be like trained in how to operate these things so if you yes. watch a video the teacher had a contact a member of the av club and they bring AV the video club, that's right were you in the av club ever in high school no, or, or no, no i wasn't no. either i, I wasn't just either. went home and cried every day that was high school for me yeah i was in yeah. the cry club <laughs> It was, oh, you, you too. Yeah, that's because I was. We, yes, I was. we would have been friends. I, I was on the golf team, but we were so bad, we never qualified to ever play. It was just us walking around, talking and hitting. Like, I don't know that we even kept score. Mm. That's, a, that's a good memory, actually. It is a good memory. I like that. It's like, like playing that. bridge and not, you know, and not wanting to win. As we've often mentioned in this, in this podcast, that's right. The point of games, you have to play to win for the game to work. So we were not gaming to win. on the golf course. We were that's just... Right hanging out chilling right right and that's that's great that's yeah great. it was good so this this video it's it, it has two hosts fred serval and um lewis aguas vivas and they have four guests on this video it's a panel just really fascinating people on this who who bring great insight to the top, subject of colonials and board games. yeah they really and yeah fred is a board game designer i didn't know I that he's in okay. france I, that was my impression. That was my impression. Yes. Yeah. The and video then, is in English, but it's, yes, I think yes, he's French. So it's very, um, it's intercontinental and it's in English, but we've got various people, various backgrounds um, because yeah. one of the guests I think is Puerto Rican by background. Of descent, I think. Or at descent. least, yeah. I'm not sure where he, where he is home for him that he, you know, childhood memories are, whether it was Puerto right. Rico or, or you're, you're thinking maybe it was stateside. Right, I think he lives in New York um, now. But yes, the, the guest we're you were I think referring to is Jason Jason Perez, who's actually someone yes. we've talked about offline. Maybe we have a great a guest. That would sometime. be great. I really, yeah. yeah, I think he's yeah. I was very yeah. intrigued with his comments, so he's great. He has and a shelf stories. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, shelf stories. Uh huh. Yeah, and a YouTube, a, a YouTube channel. channel that explores board games and ethics. So, which is the guest? Maybe we could do a hostile buyout of shelf stories. I think he could buy out us, probably. And Aguas Vivas, do you know what his No, I don't know about his story. Yeah. No. Um, whether he might be in France as well, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. It should, we should say about Jason Perez, he was also the cultural consultant for the recent reimagining of Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico 1897. And we'll right. get into maybe a little bit of that later on about why that, was, why that happened or the importance of that. Train was another panel member. He's a war game designer. Uh, uh, Mary Flanagan was probably the the uh, the keynote speaker of the panelist. She is the co-author of a book called Playing Oppression, which is a, a book all about colonialism and board games. And, and she really, her, the panel said again and again, her book was really what inspired this panel discussion. Uh, wow. And then the last guest was one of your favorite designers, oh. Kevin. Who was it? Cole Worley, I'm no expert, but it's, he's doing board game design that that borrows from wargaming, but also tries to be anti-colonial because his his PhD was on colonialism and imperialism in nine, I think 19th century Afghanistan. So he, he's, he's I didn't got know that. Various interesting. Yeah, 
Yeah. So that really helps explain his insights in Pax Premier, this great game that he... I think so. One of his I great games so. that yes. he designed. Yes. Uh, yeah. That we got to play together. Interesting. I yeah. I yeah. The rules. No, it was good. It was good, man. It was, it was I good. I love these rich games, but boy, you, you put it aside for six months and you really... Yeah. Everything's like a, oh, right moment, or at least for me. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, and I think what was it helpful is. at the, the beginning of the video is they all acknowledge that they're, they come from a very North American perspective. Uh, and all of them on this issue of colonialism mm -hmm. and board games. And I think it's important just for us to acknowledge that w you and I do not necessarily represent the most uh, diverse perspective on this topic either. You know, you, you, you sure. had, we're, we're both a, a couple of uh, white men in the United States of America and Protestant, Christian and middle class and, you know, and, and United Methodist. And so, so we certainly don't bring a diversity of background to this discussion, but I, Right. But I, I still think it's an important discussion to have uh, in any circle. And so we're going to yeah, try our best to represent it fairly. It, just yeah. Acknowledge, yeah. yeah, where we're coming from. Yeah. Um, yeah. But first, before we get to this. Yes, first. We need to open the mailbag. Yes, I'm going to open up the mailbag now. Um, oh, no, he's going to do the horn. <laughs> Daniel, <laughs> your mail does not arrive with horn. The mailbag. Oh, mailbag. I shouldn't have made it out of um, out of brick. Um, <laughs> there we go. There, there's the mailbag. I'm going to pay your mail carrier to use a horn one day just to mess with you. Our Hi, mailbag, mail? yes, <laughs> is is a listener spotlight this morning. Uh, at the end of our newsletter, we give people the opportunity to let us know a little bit about themselves. Um, sidebar, if you are not subscribed to the newsletter, please do so if you want to in our link tree and we might highlight you if you fill that out. That's right. But it's every two weeks. It's every just two weeks. a couple of comments and show notes. So it's pretty casual. It's not a hard read, right? So it's not, we're not going to fill up your inbox and that's uh, another way to be connected. So yeah, bi-weekly newsletter. Yep. 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 We don't ask for money um, very often. And by that, I mean ever, but right. It's, it's fun. But we will and, take your money. But we will uh, if you offer it. So our listener spotlight is Carrie. Carrie, um, we're so grateful, Carrie, for you listening and subscribing to the newsletter. Carrie is uh, said that she is a teacher in North Carolina. Uh, she found out about Board Game Faith through Facebook. Uh, we asked, what's a game you're digging right now? She said she's really she tried Sequence recently for the first time and really enjoyed it. And I, I'm, and I was looking that up that I know I... Always hear great things about the game. I'm not sure I've ever tried Sequence. Have you? That Kevin? I think I have. We've played it. it. It's a or my family or a church. We played it actually. It's okay. a. It, it looks like cards, right? Like a deck of yes. cards. Is the, yes, but it uses a little um, and checkers. Like dominoes. Yeah, 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 or something. Like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, it is fun. It, it's a neat game. It's different. Yeah, I liked it. Yeah. So I've only done it once, but I think it's a classic. Yeah. Yeah. So good, good choice, Carrie. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Um, and so mm -hmm. we also ask our, our listeners in this form, what is awesome about you, her? And she said her awesome superpower is that she can wake up at 5 a.m., which is a remarkable superpower. That, Very that takes method a special... of superpower, to be honest. It is. It is. And I was thinking that's, you know, I, in North Carolina, she's an hour ahead of where I am here in the Midwest. So, I mean, I, I, to keep I'm up with she, Carrie, she's getting up at four a.m. My time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that right. takes a special kind of human being. It does. It um, does. So more power to you, Carrie. Uh, I, before we were going online, Kevin, you and I were both talking. We can't sleep in as much anymore the older we get. But I think I would still be hard pressed to get up at five a.m. Just naturally. Yes. I I, yes. I do it I when I have to. I, you but, know. Yeah. It's like training for a marathon. If I train for it, I could yeah. do it. Yeah. But it's yeah. not. And and I'm usually up by. Six fifteen, uh, yeah. and sometimes I'm awake at six. If I'm awake at six a.m., I'll just get up. You know, quicker time. I mean, I can get to the coffee faster if I get up earlier. So that helps. There is a bit of that. But you're right. If we ease out. into it, like the next day, you get up at five fifty nine, and then the next right. day five fifty eight. Right. And then you know, by the summer, you're getting up at five. Right. And maybe if I get up at five, I will actually win at Frost Pump, the board game. Because you have the another hour to invest. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then and then finally we asked Carrie, why do you listen to Board Game Faith? And she very kindly said the, the awesome hosts, which was nice of her. Um, so thank you, Carrie. We appreciate that. Aww. That must yeah. yeah. So 
Thank you very much. Um, so Carrie, thanks so much for listening. We really appreciate uh, your being a part of the board game family, board game faith family. And uh, we, we appreciate uh, we appreciate your your support and your care. And we uh, and we'd love to highlight some more of our listeners can't to you in the future. Care without Carrie, you can't. You can't. It's right inherent to the name. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, so, uh, getting back to colonialism in, in board games, this podcast, our podcast on the intersection of board games and religion and spirituality. So Kevin, why is this, why would we be discussing this topic on a podcast about religion and spirituality? Why, why does colonialism in board games matter to matters of faith and religion and matters of the spirit? Would you well, say? Well, um, I mean... Board games tell a certain story, at least some board games. I, I think I think there are kinds of board games that are very abstract, such as sequence. And this, it's not telling a major story. That's really just trying to optimize points. But if a game is less abstract, it may be telling a story about a location or a place or a people. And that could be a game like Catan, that the story is you should go and develop and conquer and spread out. And the question becomes, is that a story that we are aware of and that we're comfortable with? Does it match our beliefs? Mm. And for and all religions stress some sort of notion of justice and compassion. That's fair, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so it might be troubling if as religious people who are obeying the commands or will of God or a sense of compassion in the universe or regard to social systems? Are we telling a story that maybe makes us uncomfortable? One way to, I think, unlock this is there are certain stories we wouldn't want to tell, such as how to be better racist or how to be better anti-Semitic or how to, how to be the better Nazi. Like those are story, those are games no one would want to play that has a moral code. Right, right. right. So are there games that maybe go against the moral code that we're not, we're co not cognizant of because they're, we just don't notice the story they're telling. They've crept in. And a weird bit too is board games are born in the Victorian era, the, the 1800s, because of the invention, invention of cardboard, modern board games, I should say. Right, right. Modern board, board games have been yeah. around for millennia. Right, um, right. But modern board games come with cardboard, but they also come in an age of empires. Mm -hmm. So it's very quick to do games that are about wars and also about conquest. Yep. Because yep. that's the era. What would you add to that, Daniel? Yep. No, well, I, I just, that's a great insight. Yeah, just a couple of things. One, I, I want to circle back to what you just said about modern board games, the cardboard-based board games being born out of the age of, of imperialism. Because I think that's a great launching off point for some specific points in the video. But yeah, I would just, in terms of why it matters to matters of, of religion and faith and spirituality, I would just echo what you said, Kevin. I mean, that I think all um, religions teach that um, in one way or another, matters of compassion and kindness and mercy matter to God, right? And, 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 uh, and is this a topic that helps us to grow in some ways in that understanding of compassion and, 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 and fairness and justice or, or not. It reminds me a little bit in, in Christian circles, some people may be familiar with the rise of a particular school of Christian thinking called liberation theology in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, some Latin American theologians, folks like Gustavo Gutierrez and others who in some ways said something new, but in some ways, in other ways said something that's always kind of been a part of at least a uh, Judeo-Christian scripture, which is that God, as we read about God in in the Hebrew Bible and the Christian Bible, uh, seems to have a, a an especially uh, deep concern for um, persons who are experiencing poverty and pe persons who are um, who are experiencing oppression or who are kind of living on the edges of the marginalized of society. Sometimes the liberation theology talks about it kind of as God's preferential option for the poor. And, and we can talk about it many different ways, but, but it's just this idea that we encounter again and again and again, especially I'm just familiar, more familiar with Judeo-Christian scripture, but perhaps other scripture as well in other traditions that, um, 
I mean, the Bible just talks a lot about the experience of people living in poverty and that how mm -hmm. that matters to God, you know, and the, and and the experience of people who are marginalized and how that matters to God. And so, if that matters to God, and and therefore it it matters to or should matter to folks who are trying to um, figure out what God's calling is in our lives, then then it's hard to deny the um, the implications for that for issues of colonialism because colonialism is kind of built upon this idea of systemic poverty and systemic marginalization and systemic oppression and you know and how do we so I guess that's just another another connection that I would I would lift up in terms of why why we're talking about this on a board game and religion podcast. Uh, but then I want to circle back around to what you were saying about, um, if it's right with you, Kevin, about uh, the modern hobby board game arising out of the age of imperialism, because it reminds me of maybe the first specific point to talk about from this video, which is a point that Mary Flanagan made in her book, which is the interconnection of mechanisms and theme in, in game, in games. And, and what, what she said, which is a, a, a thought I'd really never had before was in many cases, you can't just retheme a game uh, and take away the problematic nature of its mechanism. She, she, she said in some ways, these mechanisms, at least some mechanisms developed to communicate a specific ethic, to communicate a specific morality. Right. And, and, and she makes the argument that mechani game mechanisms are not necessarily morally neutral. And I thought that was such an interesting concept. And I've been, so can I've been really wrestling this with specific? it. Yeah. What, what, what do you think that might look like specifically? Yeah. I, I think, you know, what she might say, and I, I don't want to put words in her mouth and I haven't read her book, but I think what she might say. But that's never stopped Daniel from. No, from no, exactly. That's, that's what a preacher does. Yeah. A, a preacher makes a career out of putting people, voice, words in other people's mouths. Right, um, right. What she might say, I imagine from watching the video, for example, about modern board games, is that a uh, game where you have maybe kind of an army of workers that you deploy, right, to diff two different kinds of things. Um, by the way, I love yeah. worker placement games, right? Worker placement games are some of my favorite games. But, you know, if this were set within a... But she said, you know, maybe that, that mechanism... Fr Frostpunk has worker placement. I love worker placement, yeah, too. She... You know, but what she might say, for example, is, you know, that that whole mechanism is based on this idea that the workers yeah, I think you're right. don't have agency. The workers oh, don't have really right. ability to choose over their lives. That yes. this, this mechanism automatically puts us in a place of say, oh, no, I really no. don't care about your choice or your freedom or your ability to do anything. See, this is what I want you to do. That's so good because Kinda. I was thinking I would lean towards that the pro the colonialism in board games is more about acquisition or competition. And I would have thought that Euro type games where it's more about worker placement or victory points were less colonial, but you've just enlightened me. You just schooled me that, that actually worker placement can still be colonial in the sense of, you know, I'm the boss and I'm going to make you and all you citizenry have to do what I say. And they have no agency. They're just automatons. It's, yeah. it's, yeah, it, it was something I had not thought about either until really watching this video, but it's, it, it was, it's very thought provoking. If, if our viewers have watched it, you encourage you to watch it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I do remember as we're talking, another example she mentions, or one of them mentions is one of the very first, what we see as kind of modern hobby board games of our era, Catan, you know, that this idea of Catan is it's built around this mechanism of you go to this, you go to this, this island that is supposedly uh, unoccupied, right? Terra and nullius. Terra nullius. Uh, all right, I've got. Uh, I want to. I want to hear more about Terra, terra nullius as well. I, I can't um, tell. It's a secret. It's like Fight Club. <laughs> but but she talks about specifically the robber mechanism in Catan. That you go to this. Un, you go to this. This supposedly unoccupied island. Who you harvest its resources. You exploit its resources, and then. And the supposedly unoccupied land, all of a sudden, there's this person who pops up, who's the robber, who I guess maybe lived there actually after all, but them, and and now 
they take the resources from us that we took from their land, but we call them a robber for doing that. Right. We hate them. Yeah. 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 Robin Hood is evil. Right, right. So anyway, so she mentioned that as another example. You just talked about terra nullius. What's, what's terra nullius? Besides that is a, a Latin phrase. Sorry. Yeah, it's a Latin phrase for an empty land. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like there's no one there, right? So it's a null place. Mm-hmm. I, I think of the moon in theory. Like mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. if there's no life on there, I, I guess in, there might be places that are null places. But on Earth, it's actually... Is it fair to say there is no empty place because you still have life? I think that's fair to say. And life is complex. So even if it's vegetation, if we take from the veget from the if we take from the rainforest, it still impacts human life in difficult, problematic ways, such as as impacting the environment. Right. Right. But so right. the earth is it, so maybe the moon not having an life or an ecosystem, and I'm just guessing here, I am no astronomer or scientist, but it seemed to me that that something like the moon, which is basically a big rock with some atmosphere and gravity, right? Does it have atmosphere? But it doesn't have an ecosystem. Right. But everything here has an ecosystem on Earth that is complex. So uh, even if there are no humans there, there's still going to be impacts that are hard to foresee. Yeah, yeah. Everything is connected. Tip, everything is connected. But typically there might, and there might be nomadic peoples that use the land, but they're not there currently, or they don't have a system of private land ownership. And the idea that you can simply take it and win the game and do whatever you want is, is problematic. And to right. glory in battles or or zero sum type things that I win to, by taking from you. Or that native peoples are wasting resources on a land, so we're going to do better by taking it and strip mining it. We'll we'll get more out of it. Right. Now, it may involve, like coal mining in West Virginia at one time, simply blowing up the top of the mountain, what they used to do to get to the coal, and then you just plant some trees on top to make it look nice. But uh, but that that is a more effective way to get to the coal than the Native Americans, sure. But is that who we really are yeah. people that blow up land to get more coal to burn for stuff yeah and wonder the and 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 are the long-term implications of that better mm-hmm. than the than the long-term implications of of a different approach yeah or right. of the pro- do you think there are any game mechanisms that are morally neutral I, like i think about i've been thinking about this and i don't know the answer to it in response to to her argument, to Flanagan's argument that that at least some mechanisms have an inherent morality built into them. I think about like, you know, like the most abstract game of all, you know, I, I'm just, as I don't know what it would be. I mean, if you'd imagine the most abstract game ever, I mean, do those mechanisms carry an inherent ethic or morality even? If they do, it must be very light, correct? Like it's, it's a, it, it's not going to make a big impact. Like I think of something like Go. I mean, it's a competition, but you really can't have a game with more than one person that isn't competitive. Mm-hmm. And you are taking from each other. But so it seems like to me, if you took away even competition, there is no game. So I, I think there are games. I guess if you play Go enough, it might, in theory, teach you to be very competitive and. I guess it still has an ethic, but it's not teaching a narrative. There's, it, it seems to me it's narrative and setting that really leads to problems. But I'm, I, I have not studied this in depth. It's what do you good, think? No, I, I, it makes a lot like of sense Jen to Rummy. me. I don't see that Jen Rummy or a card game with cards or teaching an ethic. I think you're right. That maybe, maybe the only, maybe the main ethic is it's better to have more points at the end than not. Maybe, you know, maybe that's it. You know, like it's it, that there's more value in having more points than the other person. I mean, maybe but that's to it. Bernard Suits' definition of a game, that, that's required for a game. Otherwise, right. it's more of just a pastime. Like, right. We, could, we right. could sit around and crochet and knit. And if you play a game where you don't accumulate points, that's kind of what you're doing. You're just, it's more of a hobby. Right, right. It's the competition that makes it a game. Yeah. 
So we, to get rid of games, we'd have to rule out competition and sports. Yeah. The, so the overcoming of an obstacle. Top, I'm sorry? Yeah, or the overcoming of an obstacle, right. Overcoming right, of an which obstacle. Is, which maybe mean, another way of saying competition. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so it could be a solo effort, as Bernard Suits says in his book, The Grasshopper. It could be, I'm going to see if I can take this route faster. Like I'm going right. to run home and I'm going to see the obstacle becomes time and you're trying to beat your own time. So if, if we only played solo games, then there's no harm, I guess, to other people. But that's a lonely existence. Most people enjoy games because of the socializing. Yeah. That, that's a huge influence. But I don't know what Dr. Flanagan would say about this. Yeah. Well, you know, a major component of this idea the inherent ethics and morality of game mechanisms is what we mentioned earlier, lightly on the sense of worker placement, rising agency, you know, which is the sense of within a narrative, a person's ability to make choices for themselves, you know, to, to that's shorthand for that. It's kind of agency. Um, and this brings up, I guess, one of the other major points of the video was this contrast between agency and erasure. Um, or erasing people or recognizing their agency. And I thought that was fascinating too. And I wonder if we could talk a moment about that, that, that I think Jason, Jason Perez was saying that, you know, every game is an abstraction, right? Of some, of some, of, of something, right? Even the most narrative game, most in-depth game has some abstraction from reality. Otherwise it would be, rea it would be the reality, you know? And so anytime you abstract anything, you have to erase something. Right. And so his, 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 his question was, think about what you're erasing and who you're erasing, you know, and, uh, to get to that abstraction and are there ways of, yeah. of, are there, uh, since we have to erase, let's be thoughtful about who, what and who we're erasing. For example, he talked about another very popular game, Ticket to Ride. Um, one of the, again, foundational games for modern board game hobby and who, who doesn't love, to, love Ticket to Ride. I love a good Ticket to Ride game too. We talked about, you know, think about, you know, the air, especially the original Ticket to Ride, think about the era at which this was set, you know, the, the spreading of the railroads across the United States in the original game. You know, he said, so, well, who, who are we erasing in that narrative? Well, we're, we're erasing a, a good number of people. We're, we're erasing the, the railroad workers, you know, the people who made that possible, most of whom were immigrants, you know, all of whom were immigrants at that point. Uh, and then, and then also we're erasing the native populations that were displaced, you know, as these, as these railroads went through their lands. He, you know, he's asked the question, what if we had a game where we didn't erase, we didn't erase, we chose to erase something else and we figured out a way to lift up the agency of, of the workers or the native populations or what are your, th anyway, agency and erasure or eraser, erasure, erasure. I'm not sure I'm saying, erase, I'm not sure the game. how to say erasure. No, what, what absolutely. Do you think? I, I, he's so right that, that a game has to abstract or because history is difficult and real life is complex, like ecosystems, history yeah. and living have are multifactorial. There's various factors going on. There's elements, there's things to reconsider and consider. So a game has to make it simple. These are the rules. This is how it works. And so that's really great to point to, okay, so what did you simplify? What did you remove? And, and the easy things would be to remove hard work, sweat, labor, ends of mm -hmm. conquest, and just mm -hmm. make it feel like a game. Like that, that's a way to live with that reality is to gamify it. And, and it's a, a brilliant point, I think, to point to, to point to erasure it in agency. One way game designers and games have tried to avoid this, or, or I shouldn't say avoid, one way is they've tried to grapple with this are the coin games, which are war gaming. And it's so interesting that so much of modern board gaming comes out of war games, but it's counterinsurgency coin. Mm -hmm. And the idea of different people are at work in this battlefield and they operate with different rules as well as different win conditions. So you get a much more historical approach of, it's not just like in, in say risk or in Stratega where it's two similar forces banging against each other, but you might have the native peoples who are trying to accomplish this goal. You might have one 
group that's shipbound that operates this way, one group that's land-based that doesn't have ships in a Navy. So they operate in a different way and they're all, they all win in different ways. Right. It's right. not simply by conquest. Right. Right. And so I've got the game, the only coin game, well, people say, and I think they're right, that the root game is a coin game that's been given an animal setting. And then I have the Cuba Libre game. And, and in that you learn about the mob as one of the guys you play. And there's two different groups fighting against the Cuban government as well as the Cuban government. And uh, the U.S. is looming and get over this as well. So it's, um, yeah, it's really interesting. I, I remember that mentioning Cuba agency. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, I remember the mentioning no. Cuba Libre as, as an example of that. And Brian Train on the panel, I think, Sounds like he his war games often embody that that mm -hmm. sense of counterinsurgency. And you mentioned Root. Um, it's another example from Cole Worley's again, your your beloved game, Pax Premier, seems to kind of turn this upside down, right? That I mean, you could tell in and you know Pax Premier a lot more than I do, but I know we've talked about it briefly before on this podcast, but this game, you can tell that he made the intentional choice to think about who am I going to give agency to in this game. And, you know, it could easily be a game, a story about how the British and the Russians are battling over supremacy of Afghanistan or whatever. But, but, but as I understand it again, and please correct me if I'm wrong with this, but he subverted that and really made it a game about uh, the, the indigenous population in this area mm -hmm. and how they are aligning themselves or how they're not aligning themselves and how that really it's the, imperial powers that are treated as an asset and a resource. Yes. And and it's the it's the indigenous population that are really given the most agency in the game. Is that sort of fair or Absolutely, yes. Yeah. And and the indigenous Afghani tribes are manipulating the empires in some ways to achieve their own goals. Yeah. So as well as it's card a lot of it's card based and he's included historical figures and moments and peoples on those cards as some flavor text as well as what they actually do. So, so what the card can do within the game is connected to that person or that there's a group of people. So you, it, it's a really great game of, of learning some history as well as the reality of a long, long decades struggle of various yeah. people yeah. within a limited resource, which is the land of Afghanistan. Right, right. Uh, so Pamir is is a mountain range in Afghanistan. So the title is referring to the piece of the Pamir Mountains, P A M I R. Mm. So, but la, la, so more. So even actually, never thought of it. Even the title is sort of resisting the national borders that were assigned to Afghanistan, I guess, by England. It is. So it's not a about more. a ge an arbitrary geographical line. It's about a place. God, never thought of that. The more we talk I about hate, it, the more I, I want to Cole Worley so much. He's so smart. He's so brilliant. I can't wait I to wanna... meet him so I can punch him in the face. <laughs> I want to get back straight. I just want to beat that guy up. He's so I wanna... too good. I, wa I want to get a great. copy of that game now. And the more we talk about it, the more it sounds great. Or I'm going to drive to North Carolina. That's it. And under cover of night, steal yeah. it from you. Or... It does have a solo variant and it's pretty good. There, okay. there are. It's not easy, but it's not frustrating either once you get it down and the solo version the person you're playing against is like a religious revival aspect that i think is based in history maybe oh, interesting. so it's sort of like a a coalition of various forces lining up within a religious figure okay so okay. you're it gives you kind of a basis of why you're struggling against them mm. yeah and also the player mat or the the what, what would have been the player board is made out of cloth yes which i understand yes. is not only cheaper but it also gives yeah. that afghanistan feel because it's got a sort of muslim arabic motif around this cloth play board i like that map it's, it's yeah i know it, it, it's it, a beautiful it, game you put it on the table and it feels right you, you know you're playing something different oh i gotta get this just by the uh, components yeah it's a great uh, game it's not that uh, expensive either no, no no it's a 60 i mean yeah it's like two frost punks or half a frost punk. <laughs> well, uh, I wonder as you're approaching the 
the end of our discussion of this video, if there might be might be one other topic to talk about the video, if it's right with you, Kevin, which is yeah, um, I found there they got a little bit into this topic of what is helpful and unhelpful in the debate and in this debate, and I found that really interesting. And if it's okay with you, I thought maybe we could maybe just just share a few reflections on that as well. That that they mm -hmm. they offered some thoughts on what are helpful approaches to this issue and what are maybe less helpful approaches to this issue. Um, and uh, can offer some thoughts on that or 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 if you want to start, whatever you'd like, however you'd like to, to tackle that. Any initial reactions yeah, you're dying uh, I'll to share? In. I'll, yeah. I'll lead that, uh, you know, what's helpful is to ask questions and to be self-aware. Yeah. And, and so what is this game teaching if it has a theme and a setting and a story? And is it a story I want to tell? And this reminded me back in our episode with Ali Karar, I think the first interview, we'll put a link down below because he's actually been on twice. He is Karar, K-A-R-A-R, -A -R, number 2K yeah. on YouTube and Instagram. But he commented as a Muslim that he does not want to play games that promote winemaking or alcoholic drinks. Right. Because right. that is, is against the, the practice of Islam. He said some Muslims disagree with him, as I recall, yep. but that's his approach to it. And that's a great example of someone who says, there are games out there, there are things out there, but I don't want to be a part of it because it doesn't promote, it's not part of my religious and ethical background yeah, yeah. or beliefs or practices. So I think one of that is just being, you know, asking questions yeah. and being aware yeah. of, of what you're doing. Yeah. What about you? What are yeah. some thoughts you have here? Yeah, that's a great, a great, excellent point. Yeah, I think, and I think you're right. Asking questions and uh, lifting up Ali's feelings about use of alcohol in games is a great, is a great example. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I think the part that really stuck out to me from the video was another point made by Jason Perez, where I'm kind of paraphrasing him, but he says essentially it, it's really not helpful in this debate to say, well, the people who do this, they're bad people, right? Like they, these are, these are bad people. I, and as, as, and I think he said, you know, what, what is more helpful to say, I mean, and what he means by like the people who are making games that deal with, with colonialism, he said, you know, it's not helpful to begin the conversation by saying you're a bad person for making this kind of game. Um, he said, what's more helpful is to talk about widening the audience uh, and to debate and argue and talk about the merits of an idea uh, as the value of a human being. Uh, and I just found that really helpful. It reminded me of uh, an article I read. I may have mentioned it earlier on the podcast in a previous episode, but I don't think so. Uh, of a podcast I listened to recently, not an article, a podcast I listened to on being, I mentioned it in our newsletter, that's where I did it, with a journalist named Amanda Ripley. Um, who says, you know, in issues of co high conflict and high conflict is where you just, you can't, you can't even fathom why they understand, why the other side believes what they believe. You just feel like they're irrational subhuman somehow that in, in matters of high conflict, there's, there's nothing worse than you can do that you can do than to humiliate the other side. Right. And she said, right. she said at the very least, let's resolve not to humiliate each other. Right. Because mm -hmm. nothing creates high conflict more than humiliation. And by, by. How I connect that to what Jason said was the sense of you're not going to make things better by by humiliating by humiliating the other side in terms of making games better or the themes better. That's not to say that we say all ideas are equal. It's not. It's not to say that um, there aren't some uh, unhelpful beliefs, wrong beliefs. We 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 say that. We debate that, we argue that, we hold to that, but we don't say that a person is somehow subhuman for, for any reason, right? Uh, and I found that, and I guess, I, I guess full disclosure here, <laughs> um, you know, we're, uh, and you know this, you know this too, Kevin. We talked, we've talked about this before. You know, our own, our own, our own denomination. You know, is is we both come from the United Methodist Church. You know, is is going through issues of we're kind of going through a long slow motion split, you know, in the in the church 
over issues of inclusivity and human sexuality. And there are there are strong feelings on all sides of it, and I have strong feelings on all sides of it. But um, on my in my beliefs, I've got strong feelings about. But it strikes me that there's some wisdom in that too. Again, not saying that all ideas are equal, not saying that uh, all beliefs are equal, but at least as a base point saying, we're not going to treat the other side as if they're less than human, mm -hmm. right? You know, I find there's some value in that. I think there's some wisdom in that because I, because I think that's what we see in, in Jesus too. You know, Jesus certainly didn't say, whatever you believe is fine. You know, Jesus didn't say all ideas are equal, but Jesus... But Jesus always insisted on seeing the humanity in other people, right? You know, would correct them, <laughs> would right. say, "I disagree with you." Anyway, what are your what are your thoughts? I I found that haunting. Jason Perez's comments on that. Yeah, no, I think it's great, and I think it is certainly right that if if strangely, if your goal is to win the argument, if you want to can get the other person on your side humiliation is not going to achieve that. And, and we see that partly with, say, Martin Luther King, that the goal there is to convict either yes. the people that are on the sides or the people that are trying to ignore the issue or even convert the oppressor. And you can't do that if you humiliate them. So right. the, the idea is to change hearts. And certainly that's what Jesus did, that, that he did mm -hmm. not... Um, he he certainly criticized all sorts of people. Yep, yep. And went after Pharisees and hypocrites. But he uh, and it's fair game to criticize people's behaviors. Yep. And and some argue that Jesus criticized the Pharisees because he's so close to them. Like they're so close to being right. Right. They they're the ones that are the most dangerous. Right. And right. so he, maybe he has a little sympathy for them because they are half right and terribly wrong in some ways in that time period. So yeah, I, I do think think that those are wise words um, in terms of a debate that mudslinging and name calling isn't helpful. Um, and we want to change minds and hearts. I do wonder sometimes in terms of politics, if it is a really difficult battle, like mm -hmm the Nazis are ri rising to power in your country or right. They're, you're dealing right. with extremism. If yep. they're playing dirty and you don't play dirty, you might lose. So at some points, I, I guess I don't want to rule out humiliation if it becomes apocalyptic, but that's, I'm not sure about that. That's a dangerous thing, but, um, I have seen in politics, some people take the high road and then they lose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, at the end of the day, what would you do to stop the Nazis or stop extremists right. or people that don't right. believe in the rule of law? We may have to do some difficult things. Yeah. That's, those are great questions. Those are great questions. Yeah. And, and how do you know when you're in a difficult time that demands maybe humility? I mean, how do you draw the line? There's, uh, how do you, how do you, to quote Bono, my favorite, one of my favorite theologians, how, Which, how by the you... way, he has a great thing on a, a Tiny Desk concert. You should see that. Oh, oh I want to see it. He just see dropped it. it a few weeks ago. Him oh, and neat. Edge. Anyway. I love Bono. That was for, that was to, to paraphrase Bono, yeah. Yeah, how, how do you, how, how do you, how do you stop the monster from taking you without becoming the monster yourself? Yes. Yes. How, how do you, yeah. Yes. Yes. And I feel like, I feel like it takes a lifetime to figure that out. Yeah. What if, what if the only way to stop the monster is to be a monster? Yeah. But then you're a monster or how a monster. do you undo it? How yeah. do you get back? And then once you become a monster, there's somebody else out there saying, how can they stop us without becoming a monster? And then once they become a monster, there's another, there's another group out there saying, how can they stop them without becoming a monster? And Right. But if the other side is mudslinging, can you really, yeah. How do you yeah. struggle? How do you win if, if if they if they are breaking the rules? You know, if the other team is is pushing the limits of fouling in the basketball game, and you refuse to do that, you're probably going to lose. Yeah, yeah. If they're kind of lean, they're not pushing, but they're leaning, and you're like, yeah. well, we're not going to lean. So, right, they're, right. They're like, hey, we won the moral game, but we lost the real game. And <laughs> if it's politics, and it's 
laws in people's lives and justice. Yeah, I, I yeah. wonder. Yeah, yeah. Great questions. Great questions. Thing. No, no. Uh, A lifetime to to f- try to figure out for sure. Do you, do you think they mentioned um, Spirit Island? I was never sure if they were being really critical of it or not. Uh, they all kind of, that? yeah, they all kind of said, "Hey, Spirit Island." As I read, as I heard them. Hey, Spirit Island is a great game. We all have Spirit Island. It, it's a it's a big improvement, but it could still be better. It's kind of how I heard them. That's say what it. I thought yeah. too. Yeah, I think that's the criticism that Spirit Island. You are local spirits stopping the invaders, right? But right. but the mechanisms are really it's the same mechanism. It's just the roles are reversed. Right, right. That it, it at least it challenge. subverts the narrative that you know it's you're not. The point is not to conquer the island. The point is to drive off the colony, the colonizers. But I think the critique was you, the native population still has no agency in the game at all, right? Yeah. There's still, there's still no agency given to the people who live there. Right. Um, yeah. You know, actually, strangely enough, that it circles back to my point about politics. Like it may be in certain situations, that's the only way to win would be to adopt the tactics of the, you know, become the monster. Hmm. So maybe in some ways I can, I, I can appreciate that idea. It's kind of like, you were they right to try to blow up Hitler with that plan? Mm-hmm. And, and it seems awful to have a conspiracy to blow up people that are in a room in the hopes you would kill Hitler. But if you kill Hitler, you could stop several years of awful suffering. Right, right. The the plan that the Bonhoeffer was involved in. Yeah. So maybe yeah. that's what I'm raising to the I I, I, yeah, I I want to put a footnote to that. Yeah. No, it's really it's hard stuff to figure out. Sometimes and I know we need to go too probably in yeah, our on our time. Go. That's but right. I I um uh, for another discussion, I guess uh, one mm-hmm. aspect of that that I think about sometimes is framing it in terms of safety, you know, like, um, not humiliating the other person, but we're still not going to, we're still not going to, we're still going to keep people safe. You know, we're not going to allow you to, to do anything that makes this other person feel unsafe, you know, or to, um, whether that's a helpful addition to the conversation or not, you know, like is, 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 is framing it in terms of how are we going to keep people safe a way to talk about it without feeling like we're becoming the monster i don't know right. i don't know it's hard hard stuff kevin hard stuff that's why it's uh great to talk with you about it and great that we have listeners who are interested in these topics as well yeah follow us on instagram and we are board gate board game faith dot net dot com dot org dot ac dot uk or you can just do board game faith and we have a com. newsletter dot com dot reality yeah dot planet <laughs> earth yeah or go to our link tree to find how to sign up to our newsletter yeah and um we'd love to have it we would love to hear your thoughts on all this as you have heard listeners we've been struggling with this a lot um please let us know what you think we'd love to get an email or post on our discord on this or um mm-hmm. or anything but we we would love to hear your thoughts help help um help clarify things for us yeah, give us your thoughts. And on YouTube, you can comment. And on podcasts, you can just shoot us an email. I mean, yep. we will um, look to maybe include your comments in a future episode. Yep, yep. Kevin, as always, a joy and pleasure to hang out with you. Same here. Bye, All Daniel. Right. Thank you, everybody.